And we did this last year with Marquette early in the season. We spent a month and a half being like, is this for real? Are we sure about this? Right. And they were a streaky team. And I'm not even saying we were wrong last year by the end of it. But what I am saying is through this year, I mean, they went toe-to-toe with Purdue, who some people have number one in the country, and gave them a closer game than we've seen Gonzaga Mm -hmm. and Duke do. And now here they are running Baylor off the floor, which I don't think anybody saw coming tonight. So, T.L., let's go to you first here. Was this result an indicator of where Marquette can be this season, or was this more about Baylor just laying an egg? Hey, let's just say this. Baylor didn't play well. I I think that goes without saying they turn a ball over way too much. Whenever you have guards like that, you would expect they're going to turn. They're going to take care of it. This was Baylor's first true road game in a ridiculous environment. But if you go down and you look at Marquette's schedule, you have to like what you see. Five point loss to Purdue. And then the only other loss is a three point loss to Mississippi State. And my main man, Tolu Smith, who's good, who's good. They're good. Like the, we, we can laugh about Mississippi State and we can make jokes about T.O. loving Tolu Smith. Yeah. But for people that don't get that joke, uh, T.O. said that if Drew Timmy played in the SEC, he'd be Tolu Smith. That's yeah, And now Tolu <laughs> Smith has been MVP of almost every game Mississippi State played. But I digress. We're not talking about Mississippi State and Chris Jans' turnaround project down there in Starkville. We're talking about Marquette. But you look at it, I'm, I'm sold on their upside. I want to say that. Are, are we going to be completely sold on their consistency? I think that's a big thing. They have played well against good teams. Uh, the, are they going to win uh, consistently these big games and other big tests against a pretty decent Wisconsin team that's going to make them play a completely different tempo coming up on Friday? Yeah, that's Wisconsin going to be took a loss tonight, by the way. They just lost to Wake Forest. Steve Ooh, ACC, what's happening? I, I'm so yeah, lost. I'm lost. I'm lost. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say this about Marquette. Uh, this is this is the start of a long build, right? So, like, go out and celebrate this win because this was awesome. This was a dominant performance. This was a statement performance. Um, I think that I don't think that Marquette is as good as they as they played tonight. I don't think that Baylor is as poor as bad as they played tonight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that I am buying the idea of Marquette being a uh, a top four team in the big East good enough to fin. Like, I, I think that if you look at the tiers of the big East, it's UConn and Creighton at the top. Right. And then I think that there's, um, then it's Providence and change. Who am I missing? Who's the, who's the third best team? Why am I blanking? I mean, Creighton, UConn are the two. Creighton, I don't know. UConn, oh, Xavier, Xavier. Xavier. I'm an, I'm Xavier. an idiot with, with Sean Miller. I mean, yeah. So it's, are Creighton we, really, are we, are we giving Xavier that third spot like that though? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying what is, I'm I think saying. Xavier, like, it's still year one for Sean Miller, and yeah. we're just handing them a top three. Seat I'm not three. handing them a top three spot. I think I feel like we have been more about. I feel like we have been. No, it says more about what the rest of the Big East is, right? Like yeah. we've seen Xavier go out and play well. They haven't won the games, and they have to eventually right. win the games. Like Marquette won the game tonight, right? But we've seen them play well, and they've looked good on paper. They look good on the eye test. So you can kind of like buy into the talent and buy into the coaching and say, I I can see a way they can become really good, right? With everybody else, it's like, okay, we got to trust that Andre Corbello and Posh Alexander are going to figure it out. Okay, we got to trust that Ed Cooley is going to get these guys to a place where they are a tournament team by the end of the year because I don't think like right now they're good enough to be a tournament team. Whereas with Marquette, like, you see them play. You see the way that Omax can space the floor and pull people away from the basket. You see the impact that uh, the Igadaro was having, the shooting that they have. Tyler Kolick, man, like he was getting so many guys open shots. And the fact yeah. that they can do things defensively, like this is, to me, this is a, a tournament team, a borderline top 25 team, and a team that is right in the mix in the top four of the Big East. And I think that after seeing this performance tonight, you got to put them put them above St. John's, put them above Providence, put them above the schlock at the bottom and say that they're right there. Like the, the second tier is probably Xavier and Marquette to me. Is that fair? Now that you let me finish my point, and I actually remember that Xavier was a basketball team that still played in the Big East instead of blanking on it. <laughs> I hey, think that's fair. Thing too too, much, too much of this, man. Yeah. Hey, another another thing too, Tyler Kolek, we talk about how good he is. Like he's shooting 42, above 42% from three this year. That wasn't the case last year. He was piss poor from beyond the arc. And he's fixed some things. Like last year, he was 28% through seven games this year. He's 42%. Like that opens things up for him big time. Being Shaka able saw to, that coming too. Like Shaka talked about that with us at the Big East, uh, Big East Media Day, T.O. He did. He did. So, I mean, that that obviously opens some things up. But if Omax Prosper turns into the Omax Prosper that a lot of people think he can be, 
Like he's been all potential, no production so far throughout his college career. If we see more of this today, like he's a really, really good player with good size who can step out and shoot it. It's just that he hasn't been consistent. It's all been potential based. Now you see one against a really good Baylor team. And then it's like, okay, that we might be cooking with something. Might be cooking with some peanut oil here. Like he, if he's that, he, he's a big time addition for them. Yeah. And shout out to Sean Jones, too. Like that dude is, uh, He's he's electric, man. Like he can't be taller than about five foot nine, but that dude can fly. He can yeah. get up and down the floor. Like when you think of shock of smart teams, you think about dudes like that that are just gonna climb up in you and be a pest and be annoying. He seems like a really annoying dude to play basketball against. Yeah. yeah. You know who he reminds me? He reminds me of a guy that Shocker recruited to Clemson that I played with named Andre Young. Yeah, I'm Andre right. Young's about five nine was a really good player at Clemson, exact same way. Big, strong, bulky guy, fast as lightning, and just found ways to get under people's skin. And he is that. Yep. Am, am I allowed to say this, guys? Because if we're all going to buy in, I'll play devil's advocate. Oh, boy. Isn't this just first half of the season, Shaka? Fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times. Isn't this just the same thing we've seen for 10 years? How dare you? I mean... Like, it's a resume win. Don't get me wrong. This matters 100%, especially by the time they get to Selection Sunday, if they happen to find themselves with 12, 13 losses, which Shaka Smart teams are prone to do every now and then, it's going to matter. And mm. no one's taking well, that away because Baylor is a damn good basketball team. But Well, that's that's why I'm saying, like, generally speaking, right, if you beat a top 16 in the country by 26 points, like, you, we're probably reacting and saying, man, they're top 10. You know, they're Purdue. They're UConn, they're Arizona, they're teams that take that leap in our mind. And I'm not there. I'm saying, like, we're talking about, like, this is a, a seven to eight seed that had a hell of a night tonight, that has okay. a ceiling when they play their best, can go out and do things like this. Uh, and I think that's kind of where I'm at with it, right? I don't think that that's saying, like, second half shock or overrating them. Because I my biggest point is, and I kind of got sidetracked because, you know, whatever, the ADD kicked in. But <laughs> everybody on this roster and, and in this rotation has three more years of eligibility. Even the right. guys that are technically juniors, right? Like when Shaka had VCU rolling, he had guys that were fourth and fifth year guys, 22 and 23 year olds that became a family that played together for so long that were in those battles together. It was, uh, that's what it was. Like he, he's, he builds culture. Like he's one of those guys. He builds a program, not just a team. And though, like this team is going to grow together. So I, I'm, I'm I'm bullish on Marquette this season, but I'm very bullish on the program moving forward. Uh, hey, can we talk Baylor real quick. Like, I, I was, <laughs> yeah, we could talk Baylor, but we got a minute and a half going. Michigan, yeah. Is oh, I'm watching one. it. You got Bentley in the uh, the YouTube chat right now, being like, Rob, what are you watching? What do, what do you think I'm watching, Bentley? <laughs> 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 what, do you, what do you think is on TV right now? Virginia's down by one uh, to Michigan. To well, let's let's let Greg uh, watch this in peace, and me and you can talk Baylor a little bit. Thank so. You. The Bears, I'm I'm pretty concerned, right? They're not guarding. They're, mm. they're not good enough offensively to be a team that's not guarding. We saw Virginia put up 94 on them, right? And Jaden Gardner makes a, a little uh, 16-foot jumper to, to put Virginia up. That's why Greg has this face now. Um, mm. But they're not guarding, and I'm worried about that because I think you can figure things out offensively. I don't know if that group's going to be able to figure things out defensively. I'm with you, but Greg, I'm sitting here looking at our YouTube chat. You probably need to get back in the middle there. Oh uh, my god! Oh my god! I'm Virginia sorry. just scored. That's in no. The I'm sorry. Michigan just Lowell into themselves. Yeah, Michigan oh, just turned them all over. Who could have seen this coming? To is on an unbelievable delay. Yeah, you're about to see it. You're about to see your boy Jalen Lowell over. I mean, yeah. they just turn over. Reese Beekman, though. Hey, Reese Beekman's a dude. I've I've been preaching the reach the Reese Beekman gospel for a year now, and he's finally here, son. He's mm -hmm. that good. All right, take me through your uh, your Baylor take, To. No, I, I think it's it's taking a second for those guys to figure each other out. I think that's a big thing. And then on top of that, they've got a couple of forwards that are still trying to figure out how to play off the ball with some of these guards. Bridges was a good player at Virginia Tech. But he was only 0 for 1. you got to create some shots for him. He's not a guy that's going to create for himself, but he can attack a closeout. But especially the last 15 minutes of that game, Baylor's guards were trying to break it down and do it themselves a little bit. Not a huge assist night for them. Uh, 12 assists to 20 turnovers, that's not Baylor basketball. That's not typical. Like a Scott Drew coach team, those guys are getting past that first line of defense. 
Uh, they're creating the chain of reactions and they're playing freely and they're finding the next best shot. Those guards aren't doing that right now. I feel like Flagler is a little bit of a score first guy. I know he had five assists tonight, but there were some times tonight where he shot it quick and he shot it early in the clock. That's not typically what we see. Uh, interesting to see how it's going to go going forward. Caleb Lohner has been kind of a non-factor and at BYU, he was kind of the centerpiece, the passer at the four position. He's still learning to play a little bit right now with his new teammates. It, there's a lot of new pieces to this puzzle. Uh, how soon Scott Drew's going to be able to figure out, it's going to be intriguing. But, uh, you know, Keontae George, he hasn't been as good as what I thought he was going to be uh, so far this season. He's still going to have these big games. You guys wait and watch. But he's still got to find out how to play with some of those other ball-dominant guards. they got three ball-dominant guards on the floor at one time. L.J. Cryer, Keontae George, and Adam Flagler. So, like, they have to – realize, hey, if I get rid of it, I'm going to be able to get it back. And I'm not sure there's that trust there yet. It's going to come because there's nobody better at finding that trust than Scott Drew. But those guys have to trust that if I give it up, I will eventually get it back. Yes, I think the biggest issue is on the defensive end of the floor with them. I don't think you can play that no middle defense with this group. And the the major reason I'm saying that is because I think the number one thing that you need when you play that no middle style of defense is just absolutely, utterly elite on ball pressure. You need to be able to climb up into people and not let them be able to see. Because right now, I think teams are kind of figuring out ways to beat it, right? The, essentially, what it is is whenever the ball gets on one side of the floor, whoever's guarding the ball climbs up basically parallel to the uh, to the sideline on the side, forces you to drive baseline. They do that because they can pre-rotate because they you only have one place to go. And they can get to the charge spot. They can rotate and take away the pass to the baseline. And there's ways teams are figuring out ways to beat that, right? You don't drive all the way in. You take little half drives and you pick out somebody on the other side of the floor. You can set screens on the guy that's supposed to be the help defender. So you get a free lane to the rim. There's things that you can do to beat that, uh, to beat that defense. And it becomes much, much easier when you don't have Davion Mitchell, when you don't have Macy Oteague, when you don't have Mark Vidal, when you don't have James Akinja, when you don't have those elite on-ball defenders or elite rim protection, it's it's very difficult to run this. And I think we're seeing that a little bit with Texas Tech this year because Texas Tech is not as good defensively as they've been in the past, and we're seeing it with Baylor. This but season. there's so many new pieces with Texas Tech, so I'm willing to let that slide. Like, we're only about 25% through the season. Like, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Baylor, another point is, Macy Oteague, he was only about 6'3", but he was really long. Mm -hmm. like these guys are not your prototypical lengthy six, five, six, six defenders that play this no middle defense. Mm -hmm. Like, so guys are able to see over the top of this no middle defense for Baylor. And that's the reason they were able to get so many shots. Another thing is if you set some stuff out high against that, like, and you're able to get into the middle, <laughs> like things open up quick. And so that that's another problem. Whenever you're watching a Baylor play a team like Marquette, with a guy like Tyler Kolick who can get into the middle and is willing to be patient and use a screen back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until he finally gets in there, like you're going to create some problems. But I think their length is a negative this year, especially at that one, two, three with those three mm -hmm. guards. And then it makes it much more difficult to be disruptive because you don't have that length that people are seeing over the top. Yeah. And what I will say is this, I, I trust Scott drew to kind of figure this thing out. Bingo. Yeah. Of the course. same way that I trust, Bill Self to try to, to, to go and figure this thing out. The way that I would trust Tony Bennett to go and figure it out. The way that I would trust any of the elite coaches in college basketball to go and figure it out. So he's going to find a way to make something work. Um, it's just, I think it's going to be have, have to be something different than what they're doing right now.